We have all been uniquely and lovingly created in the image of God and called to live in fusion with Him and with one another. I'm Robert Richard Dell, and welcome to The Converging Zone. Welcome to The Converging Zone. I'm very excited today because not only do I have a great guest today to present to you, but a friend that I'm actually a fantastic fan of. Welcome to the show today, Dave Dahl from Dave's Killer Bread. No. <laughs> Shake the <this> fist <laughs> like it. Dave's Killer Bread. Dave, you know, we got a chance to meet uh, south of Portland, Milwaukee, Oregon, mm -hmm. where, where your uh, bread, bread companies. Quarters. Yeah. Killer it? Bread Quarters. Bre Killer Bread Quarters, Milwaukee, Oregon. And, and this is the good seed bread. We've got several flavors here, Dave, but tell us a little bit about how the good seed, what this good seed bread means to you when you develop this bread. Well, this is one of the original killer breads, and you know I named it before I created it. I, I, I created a loaf of bread that was a good seed bread, but it means a lot more to me than that because I used to be a bad seed. Everything I touched was destroyed, and now um, I like to think that I'm planting good seeds and making a difference in the world. This Dave has a story. He's a four-time loser. I made a mistake earlier. I had something written down that he was three times. He reminded me, don't sell me short. I'm a four-time loser. And, and, and Dave, tell us a little bit about your story. Your dad started this bakery company back in the, in the 50s, right? Or 60s? 55. 1955. Tell us a little bit about the family business, uh, how it got started, and then what it was like for your childhood growing up in the, in the bakery. My dad, as I look at it now, was a pioneer in healthy breads. And... Uh, when I grew up, I just thought he was a nutcase, and I didn't respect him, and uh, didn't appreciate what he was doing. Tried to get away from it as soon as I could, uh, although I did, I did work there for many years, I, and I learned a few things about baking. But I was depressed, and I, I had uh, ended up having drug issues and became an intravenous uh, meth, meth user, and subsequently uh, went to prison four times, and. On my fourth, fourth trip to prison, um, I discovered humility, the concept of humility, what it meant to me. And once I realized I was no better or worse than anybody else, I didn't have to pretend to be somebody I wasn't anymore. And um, that was the beginning for me uh, of, a, of a new life. You know, getting down to humility, because we talk about humility and how much pride can be a killer, mm -hmm. you know. and. Um, and by the way, he's not a killer, he's a teddy bear. The bread is a killer. When you've had it, you'll say it is killer bread. So I wanted to clarify that. You didn't go to prison for killing I've, anybody. I've gotten a little bit of trouble over that over the years. Yeah, I can imagine. So how old, what was this age that you started using drugs and um, did it start out with, with the hard stuff or how did it start? How did this whole life of drugs and, and crime start? Well, as a teenager, I, uh, a young teenager, I would just experiment around with, you know, marijuana and beer and whatever, you know, and um, I, uh, those drugs didn't work for me. I was depressed, right? None of those, I kept trying, I did all the hallucinogens and um, you name all, everything until, and cocaine. Uh, the only thing that ever worked for me was the methamphetamine and it just, uh, it just totally counteracted that, that low self-esteem and uh, depression that I was feeling. And I thought it was a savior. I called it my savior for a long time. You know, I know your dad passed away when you were in your last prison term. Did that have an impact on you? Yeah, I, don't, I didn't really understand the impact at first, but when I finally discovered that humility concept and realized that I was no better or worse than anybody, a big deal for me, then all of a sudden I saw my dad as a human being that was, had faced struggles of his own and all of a sudden it became a hero to me because he managed to do uh, uh, some really good things in his lifetime and um, even though I know he had the same kind of problems that I have with depression, things like that, and no medication, yeah. nothing like that. So um, I like to look at myself as continuing my dad's work. That's, that's the way I see it now. And you are, and you've not, you've, it's, we call it generational wealth transfer, and that is taking the generation before and expanded it even further, which is amazing. And he would love it. He would love it, and he is loving it. Mm -hmm. We talked about yeah, that. Yeah. So, uh, 
what about uh, th this turnaround? So you turned around. Tell us how you got back because, you know, you had a brother who, uh, you have family members that were still involved. Your brother was still involved in the business throughout the years while you were uh, going through your stuff. He was there faithfully. He ran the business for most of those years that uh, after my dad started, uh, his health started to fail him a little bit and he had a stroke and things and couldn't really run the business anymore. My brother took over and uh, managed it pretty well. Uh, he also, when I went to prison, they, I, it's, a, it's an important fact that uh, they didn't really support me much while I was in prison. They kind of just said, okay, he's locked up, good. You know, and I think that's, honestly, I think that didn't hurt me at all. Yeah. I think that lack of enablement, uh, you know, that, that being alone like that forced me to change. Yeah, and probably their mind was, we've done stuff in the past that didn't yeah. work and he's just making another choice and there he is again. Yeah. And How did they receive you when you came out? Well, before I came out, they saw that I was, I was in the drafting program and um, everything I was doing was, was changing. The way I was looking at life, I was no longer blaming people and the system and uh, the cops and you know, making excuses for things. I was taking, um, I was taking control of my life and I was excited about it. I was excited about the fact that I could change my life. I saw myself doing it and more, one more success after another. Well, when I got out, uh, you know, my brother gave me a chance to come back to the business and um, I saw a path. I saw a path to not necessarily riches or wealth, but um, maybe wealth of spirit and being able to create. And as a drafter, I created. I created uh, something, you know, I would start with something that was already existing and I would make something better out of it. And that's the same thing I did with the bread when I got out. And you already had some experience that you remembered back and then you heard Chris. Yeah. And so tell me about this because to me it's fascinating. You're obviously very creative. Um, you knew you were creative and then in prison got to sh remind yourself that uh, maybe that I can do some things. There is, I am, there is some good in me. Yeah, and when I, when I overcame the depression, I was able to focus on um, you know, whatever I decided I wanted to focus on. And that was when I realized that I really was creative and not just, you know, there were times I thought I was creative before, but the slightest thing would derail me. And that was really why I would get into trouble all the time. I would get derailed and I would run from the problem. And, you know, I stopped running from these problems and uh, started just focusing on and, and being, being confident, you know, yeah. being confident about what I could do. Not necessarily, um, uh, not arrogant yeah. and not you're like, hey, look at me, but wow, I know I can do something cool and yeah. have fun with it. That's awesome. And now did you, what year did you actually get out? What, what year was that? I got out December 27, 2004. So basically started uh, working in 2000, beginning of 2005 for 12 bucks an hour. Wow. Yeah. Where, at the time, what was the size of the company? About 30. 30, okay. 30 employees, about $4 million a year, three, $4 million a year uh, annual uh, gross revenues. And now it's, you know, many, many times that, so. Yeah. Well, for those who don't know, the company has gone from 30 employees to 280 employees and growing, and the, the more, more markets are opening up, 13 states now. Mm -hmm. What, uh, when you first got there, um, how was it with you and your brother? Your brother, was he hopeful? Was he kind of cautious? What was it like initially when you first got there? It was like a jungle. It was like, <laughs> like a bakery jungle. Yeah. There was, uh, it was, uh, it, there was a lot of fighting when we first started because uh, for various reasons, it just, we didn't see eye to eye. Uh, and, the, and, and it wasn't just my brother, it was pretty much everybody in the bakery just they were like this guy coming out here and he's disrupting everything and you know they it, it, it just was really tough at first we had to go after two or three years of this we found out that there was actually such a thing as um, a, a business shrink small business shrink or a family business shrink and so we went to that to, to this guy and established a vision and a mission and it changed everything Wow. Mm. And so then, and then were, were you and your brother able to see that he's got a certain gifting set and he would stay in that mode and then you have a certain gifting set and you can go free in that? Yeah, in who and the you same are. with my, my nephew is also, he, my nephew was a very instrumental um, 
part of Dave's Killer Bread and still is. And my brother uh, kind of, at this point, he helped us get started and then he kind of got out of the way a little bit and um, he's more of a golfer now than a, than a baker. Yeah. So, but my, my, my nephew still and I are still very deeply involved in everything that happens. That's great. Now, you, when you first started, tell me what you're, here you come back to the bakery, you're starting to work. What, uh, how did you initially start creating Dave's Killer Bread? So I went out and I looked at everything that I thought was good bread, you know, that was existing at the time. And I learned to uh, replicate it, to recreate it so that, I mean, I could have made their bread, but I wanted to make something that was better. So I started adding things and subtracting things and making it uh, just a, a, you know, a killer bread. Was that, was that, would you look at that as like you reverse engineered somebody else's yeah. bread, mm -hmm. saw what, what were the pieces were, and then exactly. did something better? And having, a, having the bakery background was good, yeah. but the drafting um, and everything else that I went through in life kind of added up to, um, to, to having the ability to do that, you know? Yeah. Well, I, you know, we got a chance to be there at the, at the bakery headquarters there. Bread Big, quarters. Bread quarters. Bread quarters. And uh, wow, you know, I, I love the culture that you guys, you could just see there's harmony there. There's, there's the people, there's, there's hope. I mean, you go into a company you know, and you see people really working hard, really going after it. And you guys have done a great job of communicating vision and hope into them. Tell us a little bit about how this company grew. So you started making this bread, you realized you had something because mm -hmm. people, you started going to the bread fairs and tell well, us. We, we went to a bread festival called uh, uh, the Summer Loaf in 2005 and it was actually an extension of the farmer's market. So we, it was a great opportunity. It doesn't even exist anymore. I wish it did. But we went out there and people freaked out. They were just in love with it. I was immediately getting attention from the news media and all that kind of stuff because of my story and the bread. And um, you know, the, it, was, it was very uplifting every time I'd go to the farmer's market you know, and, and sell the bread. I mean, we were fortunate enough to have a product that people wanted bad enough that demand created a spot for us at the, at the regular farmer's market every week. And that's not that easy to do at the big farmer's markets. So we knew we had something, and um, then we started getting attention from the media, and it, it just took off, you know. It just got, but it's, it was very slow. You gotta realize there was a lot of hard, hard, hard work that went into this, and um, that was really what it was all about in the first years of it, is, is just working seven days a week, uh, and being really excited about getting up and, and going, making the bread, uh, and, and meeting the customers. The customers, first time in my life, I started meeting doctors and lawyers and yeah. you know, teachers, and the, those were the people who were buying my bread at first. Yeah. And they all loved me. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So you're thinking, you know, in the past, you'd have no way to connect in with those type of professionals, and, and here they are saying, wow, this guy, I like this guy's He's making a killer bread. Yeah, and they, they were really supportive of, of the turnaround in my life. And that became almost as important probably as the bread. I think the bread is, is number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we talked, when I asked you back then, you know, because a lot of the audience here, they have a framework for the divine, for God, for Christ. And you really never had much of a framework for that, especially, you know, in your adult years. And we talked about divine, and, and I asked you about that. You said, well, there's got to be something because I'm still here. Tell me about yeah. what, that, what you sense about that. I've survived some stuff, that I, and I was very suicidal. So, you know, the fact that turnaround in my life that was in prison when I had years left to do was amazing because I, had, I, I was just like, how can I make myself so that I can survive this? Because uh, I'm going to kill myself. I mean, I don't want to live through these, all these years of prison still with no, nothing to live for. Yeah. And um, I remember finding that humility. How did I find that? Well, somebody must have, something must have guided me to that, right? Um, th that humility to go ask for help, get the medication that, I, that, that helped me to begin to focus. And, and then right after that, the drafting program opened up for me. Uh, I've been waiting for years for that. It was all a very, you know, kind of like building blocks as we went. And then, 
some of the things that have happened since then just make me wonder too, you know, and, and it, so I, I know something's up, I just don't know what it is. Yeah, well, I love this because <clears throat> I know when I first met you, we were going to be lifetime friends. Yeah. We, time, space doesn't matter, we're going to stay connected. And I know that this whole progression of your journey, that's going to expound, but I'll tell you one thing I know about Dave, he's not going to be a religious freak, but he's going to be a continue to give the divine God glory in his life because of his goodness and what he gives back, which, by the way, the culture, let's go back to the culture of your, your business. You know, you have, when I, I got a chance to interview some of the guys there, first of all, tell us how you, how you were able to give back in the way of actually giving people a hope and a vision that may have never had a hope and a vision coming out of prison, being four times, five times, the first few guys we interviewed were all four-time losers. It was amazing. Yeah, a lot of these guys uh, have very similar backgrounds to me, and they learned some humility along the way, or they wouldn't have been able to do what they do now. They um, have become, because they got these opportunities, now, I guess we didn't really explain it, one-third of the 280 employees approximately are ex-felons. Yeah. And uh, not only are they good workers, but they're excited and they're, they're grateful, and a lot of times they become great leaders, good yeah. leaders too. And so it, it, that's been a real exciting part of that. And sometimes they fail, and sometimes they fail, but I mean, to me, failure is part of the, of the, of the line that we're on. And these guys, I see them fail, and then I see them succeed in the end. Yeah. I, and so that excites me. So it's not a one-time fail and you're out. You give them, it depends. Well, they might, they're, they're gonna have to suffer a little bit for their failure, for their mistake, okay? So I've seen a couple of them just recently that I'm really excited about how they went to jail. Uh, they got off on the drug thing for a little bit or whatever, went to jail and now they're uh, back. You know, we didn't have to train them again. They just yeah. put them right back to work. I love that and I tell you, and you guys will see it on, on the next episode, uh, uh, that we present on, on IBC Network because these guys, w I witnessed a, a transformed life. Um, they, all they know is they didn't have hope, they have hope now. They didn't have a vision, they have vision now. They didn't have a, a way to provide for themselves and their future, now they do. They could, and, they, and you guys pay well. Yeah. And, and you provide in healthcare. And you know, the other thing, which is, I thought was really cool, was that cafeteria. Talk, one, talk one about this whole cafe. It's, it's called the Killer Cafe, and it's one free meal per day, per shift. Um, you know, whatever you want to eat, you pretty much choose what you want to eat, and it's healthy stuff, so we feel really good about that. Salad, sandwiches, of course. And then tell us about the, the bread give back for the employees. That was really cool. Uh, the bread that they, that they take home? Some take home, yeah, yeah. They take home either one fresh loaf a day, or they take home a couple day olds, or whatever. So, yeah. yeah. Most of them like the two-day-olds, that's a good deal. Yeah, and so and, you know, most people can't uh, eat two loaves of bread a day. They give them away. They give them away. <laughs> that's right. Which is another great marketing uh, it's the aspect. good seeds planted. Good seeds planted. Mm -hmm. um, you do a lot more. Besides what you give to your, uh, your employees, and, and lot, you're doing a lot for the community, and even beyond the community. You're just down here in Los Angeles uh, talking about bread, but also talking about hope to, to others. Tell us about some of your give back programs in your community and some of the other things that you're, you're reaching to give back. Yeah, as soon as I you know, I put the, the story on the back of the bag, maybe we yeah. should show, show them that. Yeah. Uh, so whenever, when I put that story on the back of the bag, it was mainly, it was kind of a dream come true because I remember fantasizing about telling my story, but I didn't have a story to tell, right. you know, way back when. And uh, so people needed to know who Dave was, and so I told him who, who I was. I had no idea that the community would be so, you know, uh, forgiving and uh, accepting of me. And uh, I was really, I was, I, at that point, um, they started asking me, would you please, uh, you know, come visit us and talk to our kids and talk to our uh, employees and talk to, you know, I have talked on the Senate floor now. I mean, it's been crazy. Yeah. And I don't, generally don't ask to do it. They, they want me to do it. So uh, it's a blessing. So I, I just keep, you know, I, I just keep doing that. And uh, it gets bigger and bigger. And I have opportunities to support programs that I think are helping others uh, do what I've done. And it's not easy to do. It's not easy to transform a person's, or for a person to transform their lives. 
And if you give them the tools, um, they can do it sometimes. So, yeah, and they may fall a few times. Yeah. And that's, I think, where your grace and mercy and other things and get them back in the game. Yeah, it makes then, me so happy to see somebody that falls down and, and that always hurt, hurts my heart. You know, when I'm, when I'm invested in this person, like emotionally, yeah. and they fall down and, um, and I look at them as successes and then they do that. Well, they're, it's great to see them come back and yeah. maybe they're even more grateful this time. Yeah. Tell us about some of the ones that you're working on, some of the projects that you're sowing into, bringing good seed into uh, in the community. Can you name a few of them? And there's one uh, I think that you, well, um, a special one. Well, the first one that we ever got into was called Project Pooch. And it's a, it's a nonprofit that, that uh, helps incarcerated youth, uh, that, you know, and incarcerated dogs. So these dogs are in trouble, the kids are in trouble, they work together and they, they help each other out. Wow. And that's one, one that I do. I, I mean, Living Yoga is another in Portland. Um, but when I was down here, when I was down here, I uh, just yesterday um, visited Delancey Street. And I, I can't believe, I mean, that thing is, is just amazing. Have you? Are you aware of Delancey Street? Well, I read a little bit. Refresh, tell the audience what, about the Delancey Street story. Well, you know, I, I, I'm just getting, I'm, I, I'm probably not qualified to really talk too much about them, but they have a really tough program for people who, when they're really ready to change, you can interview for this program and, um, and when you come in and they make, they work you like a dog from the very beginning. and that you know it's all run by and for uh, formerly incarcerated people uh, they don't operate with they, nobody gets paid um, and they learn to just work to make something happen they they have a they have catering program they have uh, they teach people to be movers there's all different sorts of things plus there's opportunities to go to school but i mean it's it's fantastic that these people are changing lives uh, and they've been doing it since 1972 and so where have i been i, I missed it yeah <laughs> you didn't get to apply for some reason but you but you're helping those that are and now would you call it it sounds like a boot camp it's it, like it a reformation is, reformational it's a boot camp. place like a huge hotel wow uh, here in la they have another one up in uh, they have a few more one the, i think the most famous ones in san francisco yeah but it's very big uh, and they actually they either build these places themselves or they uh, refurbish them. You know, this is an old hotel that's been refurbished and they do all the work on their, you know, they have electricians, they have, you know, uh, construction workers and they just get the job done by themselves. Wow. That's pretty cool. How many different varieties of breads do you, do you guys carry now? We have 16 varieties, 17 varieties. Uh, another one that should be here in another month or so. There's like five, um, top varieties that we that we kind of have everywhere and yeah. then some of the other ones are harder to find yeah more in specialty shops yeah mm -hmm. what when you talk about developing a new bread i mean I, so you're constantly still creating then you're not you know and we just talk about the sin dog because that's one of my favorites that's not a loaf of bread that's something yeah. more the sin dog is not something you would eat all day every day like a loaf of bread it's yeah. more of a it's a treat it's a 100% whole grain, organic, seedy, cinnamon sugar bread roll. And it was born out of necessity because at the farmer's market, everybody would say, when are you gonna make a, cin a cinnamon roll, you know, or a cinnamon bread? And this was the only, this is what I had to do. I had, I had baguette pans and I had uh, flour and, you know, what I needed is sugar and I, yeah. I rolled it up and, you know, it was one of those, another, another spiritual thing, you know, yeah. where it kind of just happened because I was able to do it. You know, yeah. you're still doing cookies, not doing cookies right now. Um, I'm really focused on making sure that the quality of the stuff that I'm making right now, that we're making right now, continues to be uh, the same quality that got us here. So that's kind of where my focus is right now when it comes to products. And you're in 13 states. Now, what do we tell the people from the East Coast that are dying to have some killer bread? Uh, it's not going to come uh, anytime soon. You can get it on uh, online if okay. you go to our website. Uh, we'll have not, the website on there. It's not cheap uh, yeah. to get it done that way. Yeah. Um, but we don't make any money on anything that goes there. We just kind of use it as a, you know, as a loss leader, so to speak. Another seed. Yeah, it's another seed being planted. And um, so 
you know, you can get the bread anywhere, but it's hard. Uh, so right now it's 13 states, they're all western states. We have it in Alaska, we have it in Hawaii. Um, yeah, we have it in Denver now. So yeah. that's one of our new outposts. Well, let's talk about, you know, besides, the, we talked about the good seed, but I think you, there's something on your body. You've actually got a tattoo mm -hmm. of the good seed. Tell us about that tattoo and what that means. Well, good seed is a very meaningful thing to me because I believe that, I believe in planting good seeds now, and I, I see the value of it for making your world better. You know, you can actually make your world better. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once you learn.